Okay, hello, good afternoon. Sorry about the late start. Um, so today we're. Uh, I said that the. I said that the uh, all the literature on the identity of the self and personal identity in the last 300 years comes from just two examples. One was Locke's example of the prince and the cobbler that we've looked at in some depth. The other was an example that someone actually suggested in class. Um, a couple of you suggested this example, um, printing off. And uh, this week we're going to look at th that example. And um, the example is actually due, I think, to Bernard Williams. But Derek Parfit, in this famous article, Personal Identity, that we'll be looking at all week, um, did most to make this famous and make it apparent how radical you can take the implications of this example to be. Um, just a reminder, the essay is due on Monday, November the 17th. So I hope you're... Ah, oh, yes. I can see all these bright, keen faces eager to express yourself. But um, at this point, you should be thinking anyway what your main thesis is going to be for the essay. Uh, so don't leave that late. Think right now about what your main lines are going to be, at least. Okay, so I want to start out by going back to Laurie Paul's stuff about imaginative understanding of your own future and how important that is and uh, uh, wh what people often call self-regarding emotions. Then we look at the case of fusion, which is this kind of printing off case. And then we'll look at why it seems to matter. So here's Laurie Paul. Um, you naturally and intuitively want to make your life choices by thinking about what you care about and what your future experience will be like as you decide to undergo the experience. That's how explaining why you want to be able to imaginatively project yourself into the future. If you're thinking about whether to go flat out and studying for this exam or whether you want to have a child or whether you want to have a second child, or which um, career you want to go in for, you're trying to decide these things imaginatively. You're trying to project yourself into the future situation. Um, and very often these are decisions that you're going to be responsible for. If things go wrong, you carry the can. If you have the child, that's your problem, that's your issue. So you're expected not just to look at what social scientists say, suits a person from your socioeconomic background, but to think imaginatively about what the implications of the decision will be for you. So you're expected to weigh evidence from your own personal perspective and decide how you want to apply it to your own situation. So knowing what your future experience will be like requires the use of imaginative understanding. Now, Imaginative understanding has come up again and again right from the start of the class when you think about Nagel and the Bat or um, Jackson's Mary. The point there is to emphasize how key imaginative understanding is to your knowledge of other people. But this is imaginative understanding. No, it's not putting yourself in someone else's shoes. It's putting yourself in your own shoes you're the future person. You, you, the future person. That's who you're trying to imagine to really understand, not some other animal, not some per other person. So, projection. I guess we use projection as reserving projection for that kind of imaginative understanding that's dedicated to your own future circumstance. If you're deciding which university to come to, if you're deciding which uh, subject you want to major in, if you're deciding what career you want to go in for, what partner to have, all that kind of stuff, these big decisions, then you're trying to understand imaginatively what that's going to be like, and we use projection for it when it's your own case. So projection is going to be what engages lots of specific emotions, um, like, if you, if you think of this uh, example where there are two future people, one, of, one person in the future is going to experience pain, the other serenity, and uh, 
You have the choice which gets the pain, which gets the serenity. It's your projection into this as your own future life that makes you say, I, will, I want to be that one. It's the fact that you're projecting into your own future pain that makes you feel fear. You can feel compassion for someone else who's going to feel future pain, but you can't feel fear, right? I mean, that makes no sense. If it's fear, then it's got to be you. Or if you think there's some dignity associated with the pain, if the context is one where uh, there's some sense of ceremony or occasion about being the one who takes that pain on, then you can feel pride about that. But again, it's only if it's happening to you. So there are lots of these emotions like pride or shame or hope, apprehension, relief. Lots of these key human emotions, they really get engaged by your projection into your own future self. Other kinds of imaginative understanding can't. I mean, if you imagine someone else's situation, someone else's pain, that might engage your compassion. But compassion is a different thing to fear. Um, so projection engages your emotions. It's practically really important because it engages all these basic emotions in a way that imaginative understanding of other people doesn't. Yep. Uh, I was thinking of imagining yourself in somebody's current situation as being not projection. Right. Uh, so if I think, um, okay, Im Im if I'm imagining how the room looks to you, that's imagination, all right, but it's not projection. Projection is when I imagine how will I be, really me, n not someone else. Yeah. Right, sure. Okay, I put myself into your shoes. I mean, I put myself into this person's shoes. I imagine I'm being followed. Yeah. Okay, I can say, what would it be like if I was the one being followed? What would I make of that? I would be petrified, right? I would be scared. Um, I can think that, but that's not the same thing as actually having my own fear engaged. That's not actually the same thing as me really being scared. Something would have gone wrong if it was like that, because why should I be scared? I'm not the one that's being followed. Within this exercise, I can imagine that my fear would be engaged. You know, you're surely right about that. If I put myself in this person's shoes and say, imagine I'm the one being followed, then that would engage my fear. But just being engaged, just doing that kind of exercise doesn't really engage my fear. Whereas, if someone rings me up and tells me dead straight, I'm going to follow you, then that would really engage my fear, <laughs> right? My actual fear. So I project myself into my own future situation there, being followed around, and whoa, that gives me the willies. You see what I mean? But... If I'm just putting myself into someone else's shoes, it doesn't get me in the same way. I might get compassion, I might get concern, but it wouldn't get that. You see what I mean? It's, re it's got to be really me putting projection and engaging all these emotions. And I hope once I spell that out, that's really basic, right? That's just how you live your life every day. That's just a part of, of ordinary human motivations. Yeah? Anything else on that? Okay, so this week what we're going to look at is one basic and pervasive um, uh, way in which your emotions can get engaged about the future. Namely, the concern to survive. The concern to survive is really basic and um, pervasive. Uh, <coughs> Here's a translation from a textbook of Russian grammar um, quoted by Nabokov in The Gift. An oak is a tree, a rose is a flower, a deer is an animal, 
A sparrow is a bird. Russia is our fatherland. Death is inevitable. Um, well, those are just the basic grammatical truths, right? <laughs> that you can't get away from grammar. Um, uh, there's an old Chinese proverb that says, How can we not fear death when from the moment of our birth it follows us like a murderer with axe upraised to slay us? I go through this because sometimes people say, I'm not worried about death. I think that is a lie. <laughs> that, um, actually, here is Rousseau on just that point. He who pretends to look on death without fear lies. All men are afraid of dying. This is the great law of sentient species, without which the whole human species would soon be destroyed. This was, <coughs> this was followed by the French Revolution, in which this theory was put to test um, with the help of the guillotine. Um, so when you think about what the fear of death comes to, I think I was, I've been emphasizing through the whole class that imaginative understanding is a really important source of knowledge about the world, and it's just as basic as scientific explanation. Science is great. Science tells us so much about the world, but our imaginative understanding of each other and of our own future lives gives us knowledge that is really important practically just for knowing what to do, and it's knowledge that we could not get from science. That's the point about the bat. No amount of scientific understanding of the bat will give us the knowledge of the bat that we get from imaginative understanding. But imaginative understanding clearly has blind spots. There are, there are things that imaginative understanding finds it hard to reach to. I suppose you think about, what is it that I fear about my own death? Well, one thing you can be afraid of is that uh, it might be painful, it might be terrible, um, or it might be, well, I'll never get to write that novel or um, finish uh, building that extension or wh whatever it is. My plans and projects won't be finished. Um, or it might be, um, I'll be leaving Millie all alone. Um, I won't be able to look after Millie, whatever it is, something like that. But there's something more basic about the fear of your own death. Something more basic than any of these things. Even if you're told it's going to be painless, um, uh, somebody else will pick up the plans for your novel and actually they will do it much better than you could have done. That extension will be superbly built. You, you were never going to do a good extension. Um, and Millie, the truth is, Millie will be just fine. Millie will be perfectly happy. Even if you're told all that kind of stuff, there is still something petrifying about the thought of your own death. There is something about the blank wall at the end of existence that seems scary. Um, it's the sense that, well, the light is going to go out. It's going to be the end of the world when I die. And of course there's a sense in which that's obviously not true. You know, we're talking about a very small ripple in the cosmos. Um, but on the other hand, there is a sense in which my whole world comes to an end then. And I think it has to do with the fact that you can't have an imaginative understanding of your own death. And Laurie Paul, all through this course, I, I've been emphasizing imaginative understanding is really important. This projective understanding of your own future is really important. But imaginative understanding of your own death seems absolutely impossible. Your imagination can't reach to the other side of that. And Laurie Paul was talking about transformative experiences like um, uh, eating a durian or uh, seeing color for the first time or hearing for the first time or having a child, where the idea was, in advance of having those experiences, you can't possibly imagine what it's going to be like to see color or to eat a durian, or whatever it is. But you can think of death as 
the limiting case of a transformative experience. I mean, nothing can prepare you to imagine what that's going to be like. I think just in real life, just in everyday life, we really struggle with that. It's very important for us to have imaginative understanding of the future. And when you reach this point, I'm going to be dead at this point. We have this, I think we all have this basic impulse to make imaginative understanding reach further. So someone said to a friend of mine, you can't possibly believe that when you die, that's it. Nobody really believes that. And it's, I think it's not that you look, in, look into your soul and you see that your soul is made of a particularly durable substance so that you know, when you reflect on the durability of your soul, you think, well, I bet that's not going to be affected. You know, it's like, um, it's like a diamond, you know, that's going to last forever. Um, that, that, that is very, very durable. For that. People, it's not, like, it's not because you're thinking like that that people think, oh, when you, when you die, that can't be it. It's because we want imaginative understanding to reach past the death. And we want to be able to project there and make sense of it. Yep. That's right, yeah. After lights out. That's right. There is the after lights out bit. Yeah, sure, the process, sure. Um, uh, oh, yes. Um, but anyway, <laughs> yeah. yeah, the process, sure, you can imagine. But it's the lights out bit that is so hard to imagine. And that's what I think really drives people who say, but we must survive that. When you ask, well, why is it that you're so sure? It's that you're thinking, well, the lights can't really be completely out. Yeah, maybe it's a bit dark. Maybe it's a bit darker than usual. Maybe it's a kind of alien landscape. But it must be possible to reach, to project with imaginative understanding in there. Because imaginative understanding is so important to us every minute of every day in ordinary life. Okay, plain as day on that. Death is a kind of ultimate transformative experience. Okay, <coughs> okay so let's look at vision. Here's, um, as I said, the second of these puzzle cases that uh, drive the literature on personal identity. The idea is, suppose a human divided into two separate people and divided in such a way that if only one of them had made it, would have been happy to say that the original person was still alive. That might seem a little technical. Um, and what I mean is, if you take it, um, I mean, I understand that amoeba or simple things like that. Right, here we have an amoeba. Yep, let's call this amoeba A. Yep, and then they, these things split. Is this right? Do we have any biology? Yeah, okay. Okay, the GSI say that's fine. Okay, right. We know all about Amoeba. Okay. Um, so there you go. It's like that, right? And then, then we have um, A1 and A2, right? So where we had one Amoeba, now we have two Amoeba. Yes? I hope this is not too technical for you. Is that, is that okay? Is, okay. So um, with fission, the way it goes is... Uh, well, the way I think of it is, suppose you're watching a movie or something like that. Okay, watch me very closely here. I just Okay, watch what I do. Right, I walk to the front, and I turn to the left. Okay? Okay. Now do it again. I walk to the front. You can see the difference. I, <laughs> I turn to the right, I mean my right, okay? Right. So, in fission... What happens is I do them both simultaneously, right? And two different people walk out here. Yes? So where there were one before there were two. I mean, how this works physically is down at the subatomic level with um, particles multiplying and so on. Uh, I'm, I'm sure the physicists understand me. Um, so that's fission, right? Uh, in the trade, X is called the original person, and the two fission offshoots are called lefty and righty. Yeah. So this is that kind of printing off scenario 
that we had before. Got an original person, and they split into two. This is, as with um, uh, the Prince and the Cobbler, once a philosopher thinks of these things, they're taken up by the popular media. Um, Calvin uh, famously has a duplicator, which when you put one in, produces hundreds of six-year-old boys. But, um, okay, so is that, is that clear what the fission scenario is? Yeah? Any technical details I've missed out? You, you, you see what the thing is? Yeah? Yeah. Uh, they're, yes, they're exactly similar. It's not, there are two brains, right? But they're exactly similar. Of course, they will start differentiating almost immediately, yeah, because one may look this way and one may look that way, yeah. But right at the moment of split, they're exactly similar. Yeah. Anything else? Okay. Well, suppose your doctor tells you, I mean, here are two scenarios. Your doctor tells you you've got something very serious. Um, in about a year, you'll be dead. That's terrible, right? That's as bad as it gets, really, from your doctor. But suppose your doctor tells you, well, we've been having more and more of this since Chernobyl. Um, in about five years, it's very likely that you will fission. Yeah? So, he says, there are really no medical side effects, no higher incidence of cancer, no higher incidence of um, uh, brain defects. People with fission just go on to live regular lives. They're perfectly healthy. Suppose you're told that's going to happen to you. You're going to fission. Is that awful or is that not awful? Is that a bad thing or is that not? Is the light going to go out or is it not going to go out? Can you project into that future life? Is there going to be two people there or there was more than one before? What's your gut impulse? I mean, can you put your hand up if you think actually fission would be just fine? Okay. And if you think no fission would be terrible, uh, 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 whoa, okay, so that, uh, <laughs> it's curious, it's divided half and half, I would say, but the ones that think it would be terrible are very clear, and the ones that think it would be fine are pretty tentative. <laughs> so if you think it would be terrible, why? Anyone? What's wrong with that? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Right. Yeah. That's true. That is going to be practically very difficult, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I worked all my life to get this Porsche. I mean, my God, who's going to get the Porsche? Yeah. Right. I mean, <laughs> not that I mean to minimize these other concerns, too, about employees and families and so on. Um, but yeah, yeah. Who gets the family? Who gets the wife? Yeah. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Yeah, how do you know which one's actually you? That's, that is a very good question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, sorry, I don't, I, I'm not sure who's next. Uh, uh, yeah, can, can, you go on. Yeah. But you get two separate bodies. I mean, it, it, see, I, I don't really have the technical vocabulary to explain all this, but um, it, it happens at a subatomic level where all the particles kind of um, multiply. Um, so the two bodies are actually exactly similar to one another and to the original. Yep. Yeah. Right. But if you think about the amoeba, um, which one has the original body? Well, the situation is exactly symmetrical. You, you see what I mean? It, 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 that's just the way the plant world, the, the, the animal, the biological world works. You know, you get this kind of um, branching. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. 
Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So just pointing that back to the, the, the last comment. I mean, if you're told, well, who's going to get the house? Who's going to get the family? The, the, that kind of question. Um, then the thing is, you might face that kind of issue anyhow. Suppose some imposter shows up from Australia or somewhere um, claiming to be you, right? They have all the papers. They look just like you. Uh, um, this is my beautiful house. And so on, um, then that would be terrible, right? That, but it's not the same as dying. That's a different thing. So, um, the, I guess the, 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 you might think these are merely practical concerns. You see, I mean, they're very striking practical concerns, but it's not the same as death. I don't know. That would be a first pass response. It's it's not clear how satisfying that is. Um, uh, one, the, the, uh, the, okay, one, two, yeah, uh, one, two, three. Yeah, let's, let's, let's try and be quick. Yeah. Your light is going out to you, it's coming on, yeah. That's very confusing, isn't it? That's absolutely the nub. That's the key question. Um, how could you go to two? Because there's only one of you, right? Yeah. They couldn't both be identical to you. Right? I mean, that seems very clear because if they were both identical to you, then, be, then they'd be identical to each other. You, you see what I mean? Uh, isn't that right? If two thi- How many of you guys have done logic? If two things are identical to the same thing, then they're identical to each other. That's right, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> I know you have to watch these logical things, but I think that's right. Um, yeah, so if they were both identical to you, they'd have to be identical to each other. So there would only be one person there. But there are two people there. They might have a fight. I mean, if the elevator said... This elevator only takes one person at a time, then they couldn't both get in. They couldn't say, well, we're both identical to him, so. You, know, you, you see what I mean? So you're right, so you couldn't be both of them. But then which one would be you? Well, the situation's entirely symmetrical. Yeah. Yes? <laughs> Good point. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh, sorry, I'm sorry, uh, you, you were nice. Yeah. Yes. Right, same of them twins. Yeah, the, the thing is, um, they're certainly different people in the same way that same of them twins are different people. Yeah, that's your point, really. Yeah. I like the idea of being at the North Pole, yeah, 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 that's good. Um, yeah, so there's no, there, I, I see, because the, the, no family, no Porsche, no, <laughs> um, yeah, um, just trying to cope with the blizzards. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right, right, so they're clearly the two different people. Is, is that your main point? Because I think that is correct. You're right, right. The, the only difference here is... Um, uh, these, the, the same Moven twins did not come from the same original person 
Ja? They come to the same oven, yes, but the, the oven itself is not a person. Yeah, that's right, but the point, the point down here is me, right? And I am, <laughs> I am not an oven. I am, I, 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 um, I am a thinking intelligent being that can consider itself as itself. The same thinking thing at different times and places. So when I try and do that here, I get into this real jam. Because it looks like I have to do it twice over. I can't be, how could I be two different people? Um, yeah, that, that's the problem. Uh, okay, uh, let me just take the time. Um, okay, good. Uh, I'll try to be quick too, but you guys have to try to be quick too. Yeah, w one, two. <coughs> yeah. I think that's great to think of it in terms of the vampire. With a vampire, you were, try the tr you were trying to think projectively about the future, yeah? You're trying to imagine what it's like being a vampire, but you find you can't do it, yeah? And it seems to me a great question about vision to ask, can you projectively imagine what that's going to be like? So I said, we have imaginative understanding of other people, and that's really important to knowing how to treat them, to knowing how to behave. But there's also your projective understanding of your own future life that is so importantly different. And that's what we were talking about with um, talking about imagining someone who's being followed. Yeah. Um, so you can certainly imaginatively understand lefty's mental right life and righty's mental life. But um, the puzzling thing is, can you projectively understand lefty or righty? And if you're, if you're saying it's kind of like the vampire case, what you're saying is you can't do that. So this is another one of these transformative experiences where there's a sense in which, I mean, lefty and righty are just regular people. It's not that they become vampires or eaten durian or something. Um, but nonetheless, although they're just regular people, you can't projectively understand what's going on with either of them. That, that's your diagnosis. And I just mean to explain that. Yeah. That is a really interesting take. I don't think it's obviously correct, but I think that's the key issue. Yeah, it may well be right. Um, yeah. You have some control over what... Yes, very good. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. That's great. Okay, so you could bind yourself. You could say, in the future, I, lefty, I, meaning lefty or something like that, will do this. Or in the future, I, meaning righty, will do this. And if you did that, and then when lefty split off, lefty would remember you making that vow. Yeah? But just as um, this, uh, this question that over here was saying, um, once lefty figures out, hey, you're not me. That's not me that made that vow. Well, why should Lefty care? Like, Lefty's just going to say, well, so much for that. <laughs> I'll do what I like. Yeah? So you haven't managed to bind them in the way that you can bind yourself. Yeah. No, that's a very important point, I think. Yeah. Yeah, very good. Yes, that's right. <laughs> That's very enterprising, yeah, right. Yeah. Oh, yes, yes. Right, so it, what I, the thing I meant by doing that thing about going left and then going right is um, if righty hadn't taken, but you just got the path from the original to lefty, yeah, then you'd have said, you just survived. You know, when I did that turn, I survived. I, you know, I, a bold, but I made it, right? right? Um, and similarly, if lefty hadn't taken, and I, I, I just went straight through, or to righty, you'd have said you survived, you made it, yeah? Um, your question is, it, it depends, I think if righty takes at all, if you go righty for a few seconds even, then there were two there, 
then you didn't make it. Yeah. But if righty doesn't take at all, if you manage to halt righty, if you manage to stop righty before he really gets going, then then you can do it. Yeah, that, that's what I would think. But the situ- I, I hope it's clear the situation is confusing. You, uh, 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 yeah, I, that's what it seems like straight off. Yeah. Um, last call. Uh, yeah. The two people are healthy. That's right. Yeah. If, if you were healthy, if you if you have problems, they have problems. Yeah. That's right, there are two different individuals there, yeah. They will both have memories that seem to relate to your past life. Yeah, they will know your past life very intimately in a way that really you usually only do. Yeah. Okay. Any any other questions about what the basic setup is? Comments? Okay. okay. Um, so then... One basic question is, would you feel pride, fear, shame of what was going to happen to lefty and righty in the way that you do with your own future self? And remember we had that discussion about um, imagining you yourself are going to be followed as opposed to imagining that someone else is being followed. Those are different things, right? You project into your own future life, you feel fear, you project into someone else's life, all you could say is, I'm just imagining that I would feel fear if I was them. So suppose it's you. Suppose you're told, well, the doctor tells you you're going to fission. And then you're told these two guys will be um, in a war zone. They will be attacked. They will have serious illness. Whatever your favorite horror story is. Do you yourself, as the original person, feel fear? Suppose the doctor tells you, well, in five years or so, you will fission. And you say, but can't you do something? <laughs> can't we do something about righty? You say, right? Um, I, don't, I never like righty. Um, but, and the doctor says, no, 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 no that's very unethical. Um, we, we, we can't do that. Um, they're not going to do anything about righty. So the fission is going to happen. And the doctor says, well, and also um, lefty and righty will have very painful physical illnesses uh, about six year, in about six years from now. Should you feel fear at that point? Or should you just think, too bad for lefty and righty, but there you go, life's like that, isn't it? So... Now that we've discussed it a little bit, let me just ask you again. Suppose the doctor tells you, you're about to fission. A few years, you'll have fission. Is that as bad as being told that you're going to die? Put your hand up if the answer is yes, that would be just as bad as being told you're going to die. Well, well, <laughs> a tentative two. <laughs> and, if you, and if your answer is, um, no, that would not be as bad as being told that you were going to die. There will be practical problems, but basically that might be just fine. Okay? And if there's some further information you would like about this case? Or why, why are people, some people puzzled? Um, what more do you want to know? Yes? Yeah, but you wonder, well, there's a level at which you don't know which one's actually going to be you, but... There's another level at which I've told you all the relevant facts. Yeah, um, I mean the situation. There can't both be you, right? But the situation is symmetrical, so there's going to be no case for saying one of them is a real me. Yeah, if you had a soul, that fission too. Yeah, um, so the, the situation is completely symmetrical on every physical, psychological, astral kind of level yeah, yeah. Um, so there's no, I mean, no basis for saying one of them rather than the other is the real you 
So you can't make a case for saying lefty is the real you. You can't make a case for saying righty is the real you. You can't say they're both the real you. The only rational conclusion is that neither of them is you. Yeah? But still, that's okay. It wasn't like dying. Um, one, two. Yes, that's exactly right. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, why should you be worried about fission? If I suppose you're told that um, fission's going to happen, but actually we don't need to kill Righty. Righty's going to be on Mars. Yeah? Um, and you think, well, it will be tough for Righty because Mars is a very hostile environment, and um, uh, we have to have lots of special surgical equipment to make sure Righty makes it through this difficult process. Um, but there you are on Earth. If righty makes it on Mars, then you will be lefty, if you see what I mean. Well, why not just wish righty the best? You see what I mean? Why not just... She was kind of mean to say, uh, um, let's <laughs> send a hitman out after righty. Um, you see what I mean? You, uh, why not just hope that all comes out for the best? Yeah. Did you get to ask your question? Oh. You, you did. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, in both of them, you are both of them. Yeah. 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 People sometimes feel like that, that about their children, right? The part of me will live on in my children. Yeah. But that's not the same. But you could feel like that, but still think of. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I, that makes perfect sense. But the thing is, there are lots of ways, you, you know, if, if you write your novel, if you write your poem, or, uh, if you build up your company, you can feel, you know, Steve Jobs might think, look, I live on in Apple. You, you, you see what I mean? That um, there are these things that you can feel I'm living on in this. Uh, that that's perfectly consistent with thinking the lights went out, I died, and that was scary. That was terrible. I would have stopped that if I could. You, you see what I mean? So. Yeah. Exactly right. So that, but that's a difficult idea. That's that's the difficult idea. Yeah. I agree. It's really natural to to say something like what you're saying, but it's a difficult idea because what does it mean? Um, more than I'm continuing to affect the world in this way, if it doesn't mean I literally continue to exist. Yeah, what, what's the? How do you get that? How, how do you it make fully explicit what you're after with that part of me? But I agree, it's a very natural idea. I'm just trying to get it. It's hard to be fully explicit about it. Between fission and cloning, yeah, yeah, it is. <coughs> yeah, yeah. So the Calvin case is a little bit. Uh, Calvin, is, I think, is thinking. Of, I mean, it's called the duplicator, that thing. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah. <coughs> yes. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Right. Uh, well, the way I'm trying to describe it is it's, it's basically gluons. Um, I mean, it's fundamental particles, right? Fundamental particles are splitting into two. Where you used to have just one fundamental particle, now you've got two fundamental particles. And that's happening right across your body. Um, 
So there's no way, with cloning, you can always say, this one's the original, and that one's the copy. But in this case, there's no way of saying which one's the original and which one's the copy. They just symmetrically divided. So the upshot we're reaching so far is the lights didn't go out. This wasn't awful. But it, but you don't survive anymore. You don't exist. That's a contradiction. How can you have made it without you existing? And we'll pick up in that bombshell next time. Okay, thanks guys. Great questions. Great comments.